when we're looking at the viral dynamics of this virus, we're oftentimes representing it on what we call CT values. That's the value that comes off of the PCR instrument to tell you how much virus was in the sample. Normally, it kind of looks like a nice triangle almost, and it looks like a pretty broad triangle. So it looks like you'd have a lot of virus a day like 8 to 15 post-infection, for example, and maybe a lot of virus at the beginning. But actually, if you, if you change that graph and you take it off of a CT scale, which is technically what we call a logarithmic scale, and you put it onto a linear scale, the difference being a logarithmic scale gives as much weight, for example, to, one, to the number, to a viral load up to 1,000 as it does from a viral load from a, a million to a billion. You know, so, so we all know that a thousand viral particles is probably not the same as essentially a billion viral particles. But a CT graph actually gives those both visually, it gives them the same amount of weight. So it's kind of like zooming in. The lower and lower you get of the viral load, the more you zoom into it. And so it's really hard for somebody who's not used to looking at these graphs to interpret these. And I think it's led to actually a lot of confusion. People keep getting really concerned about you know, well, are we catching the virus at 30 or 32 or 34? But if you zoom out and you put it all on the right scale to actually indicate the true amount of viral load, all of those differences completely fall away. The 30 versus the 34, or even the 28 versus the 35s. You know, if you've been following the CT discussion, this is like people asking the question, well, you know, when does transmission really stop? The point isn't to get exactly when transmission stops. That's going to be different in everyone. It's biologically just variable. The important thing is to know that you're getting people when they have the most virus and not just when they might maybe kind of have some potential to transmit. From a public health perspective, if we can find all of these people and we miss a few of these people, that's okay because they're really low virus anyway. So the point of this graph is that uh, when you put it on the regular scale, the real scale that shows like what the actual viral load really looks like, then you see that you just have this really tight peak and it skyrockets high. Uh, and that's because it, the virus grows exponentially. And that's like what we're seeing, for example, when you look at cases out in the community, in a lot of places like the Dakotas, you could see like the cases were kind of going along and then they just almost start going vertical. That's exponential growth. And so to really start to see what's happening, sometimes we put it on the log scale, but that gets confusing. And so when you put the viral load on this linear scale, it really drives home the message that all, almost all of the viral growth that happens in somebody is in a very short duration of time, say maybe like two, three, four, five days max. And then you have just like the fringes where maybe you have some more virus on the edges and primarily on the edges on the downslope of the virus, not on the upslope. When you plot it out like that, you can see why it's so difficult to contain this virus because it really transmits the most in this very, very short window of time. And then your body has to handle it. And the reason, I mean, just physiologically, your body can't handle having exponential growth of a virus once it gets to billions or trillions of viral particles per mil uh, in your nose and in your lungs. It can't, it can't deal with another two, two replication cycles. It would blow through your whole lung per, you know, parenchyma and, and, and all of your tissues, and it would land you in the hospital. So for most people who don't get seriously ill, their body has to control the virus very, very quickly. And that's what this graph really tries to demonstrate is just how much of the viral load is really concentrated in a short duration. And what I take from that graph too is that these inexpensive antigen tests that the technology already exists for really capture that spike. They do. They capture, they capture that spike with near, so nearly perfectly. That's exactly right. And, you know, so we keep squabbling. The FDA is squabbling. People are squabbling. We have a lot of experts squabbling over, well, are we really catching the edges? doesn't matter. You know, from a public health perspective, we want to know that we're catching people at that point in time. And it's, it's even more important. People keep saying, well, you know, what if you miss somebody at the very beginning and PCR wouldn't have missed them? And so they say, you know, these tests get, are dangerous because they could miss somebody right as they're coming up. Well, that's not even a good comparison because if the PCR test takes three days to return, then by the time, you know, if you had just waited one more day and take the rapid test the next day, 
it would definitely be positive, even if it wasn't positive the t at the same time you took the PCR swab. And so the rapid test would turn positive potentially one day, two day, and then only on the third day would you get the PCR test back. So you actually have a lot more time. It's more sensitive, not less. And that's what's so incredible about rapid tests. They give you, it's the power of getting the result immediately that gives you more time to act, not less. Gives you more sensitivity, not less. And I think that's a hard concept because it's not a, it's looking at these tests through a public health lens versus a medical lens where you kind of assume that the one swab you get is the only one, it's the only time you could possibly get it from that person. But at a public health perspective, you know, whether somebody comes in on day one or day two is random. And so the antigen test will actually be much more sensitive to find people uh, because they can tell you immediately if you're in that spike, it will tell you immediately that you're there. Whereas a PCR test, if you get the swab at the beginning of that spike, you might miss the whole spike before you get the results. And, uh, and that's a real problem.